Alright, so, um, obviously there was a whole juggling of what we were going to do with which one. Right. Um, and the original plan was always to do Leave the Weapon and Bad Boys. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, well, I don't know how well those go together. And so you suggested 48 Hours and Leave a Weapon, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, those go together pretty well. But then I was like, I don't I actually come to think that I think Bad Boys actually goes better with Leave a Weapon than 48 Hours would. I don't know. It was all it was all a confusing process, but I ultimately settled on that. Obviously, because you video last week, a couple of you probably saw that. Um, More than a couple. And then we decided we were going to probably still do forty eight hours. And then Beverly Hills Cop came to mind. And then you said, "Well, I don't know." You suggested it, and then you said, "Well, I don't know if that works." And I said, "Well, the Murphy connection is enough." <laughs> yeah. So these were his two. Uh, like I said, trading places was in between them, but. These are two of his very, very early roles, and really, really were what rocketed him to where he was. Um, let's, we'll, not, we'll not bring David Spade into this. <laughs> um, if you don't know what I mean, just Google it. Just Google David Spade, Eddie Murphy. It'll be the first thing there. Uh, <laughs> um, so... I, uh, of, of course, it's an interesting thing, because um, in both movies, he plays a very, very similar character, yet they're on opposite sides of the law. Mm. Um, but, um, yes, we'll just go right into this. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and start with Beverly Hills Cop, because I pretty much grew up on this movie. Same here. Um, so, the thing about it, well, technically, I guess technically we should start with 48 Hours, but we're not. Um, because 48 Hours was his movie debut. Uh, it was the, ver I believe the very first movie he had after, uh, like, after his, uh, first appearance on SNL. Uh, this was actually his very first movie. Um, but we're gonna jump over here to Beverly Hills Cop real quick, which was two years later. Uh, and we'll come back. Um, so the interesting thing about, well, about both of these, really, is that they are, um... Mainly known as being comedies, um, but they're also kind of like nowadays we have action comedies like fucking Ride Along, for instance. Um, but they're always more comedy than they are action or crime or whatever. Um, these movies take the that action and crime aspect very seriously. Oh yeah. While also the comedy is top notch, but they try to do they make sure they bring the quality for both genres they're trying to pull off. Um, and that's something I hate to be the, the old guy on the porch, but that's really something movies nowadays have trouble grasping. As juggle, if you're going to do both, do both. Um, don't just kind of do one and half-ass the other. you got to really, really commit to both. And these movies and the movies of this era like this were all about that. Because the comedy is fucking hilarious, and the crime stuff can get really serious. Um, and it's a really, really great balance, uh, if you can find it just right. Um, and Beverly Hills Cop opens immediately and just shows us all the stuff. Because we have, um, first off, we have our very, very 80s opening with, uh, the Heat Is On opening credits on, yes. naturally. As we just see around the city and shit like that. And then we jump right into this, where we're clearly in a crime scenario, and there's, like, you know, serious shit going down. And then we're introduced to Murphy's character, who's clearly undercover. And he gets to do... He gets to very much Eddie Murphy this scene up. And it's fantastic. Because it's 1984, it's fantastic. Yes. Um, and so we've had the crime, we've had the comedy, and then immediately, right on top of that, uh, we go into a chase scene. Um, that's relatively well done. It's very... You know, Martin Brust is the director, and he's not exactly the first guy you think of when you think of action, because when you look at his later movies, when he did... Like, he's the director of Son of a Woman. And, he, yeah, later he kind of dropped off the face of the earth when he made Geely. Um, but he made this uh, before any of that. I believe he also did Meet Joe Black. Um, very, eh, filmography from this guy. Um, but he really, really scored with this. The, like I said, the movie he made before, he made those... Um, the Sin of Woman is pretty great, and I think kind of gets, despite its picture nomination of Pacino's win, it kind of gets kind of the shit into the stick when people talk about it, but I think it's really good. Um, but you would never suspect that the same guy is the guy that brought us this. 
Um, and like I said, as far as action scenes, like chase scenes, yeah, they're not perfect and they're kind of, you know, of their time. Um, but still, the way this movie just dives right into what's going on, um, is great. And it's still, and that's not, I'm kind of, you know, short-ending it here. It is a really, you know, well-done scene for the most part for the context that it's in. Um, with, you know, Axel trying to hang onto the back and not get fl flung out and stuff like that. And then, just all this. Um, it's a perfect, it's a perfectly good opening. Uh, and then of course we get the whole what would... I'm, I'm sure by this point it was probably a cliche already, but what would become uh, just cliche after cliche as movies would progress after it. Um, he's the loose cannon, and he's got the screaming captain, and the uh, well, just the superior. I don't remember exactly what his rank was, but um, he's not happy with how Foley does things. Because you got to kind of be on his side, though, because Foley went undercover without telling anybody. <laughs> that was his method. He's a loose cannon, to say the least. <laughs> That's, that's, as we learned throughout the movie, that's pretty much always Foley's method was, I'll just go undercover. Nobody knows that I'm going undercover. I, I am just putting myself in complete danger here. Um, but the thing is, is that his character is so smart. Like, he does things where you think, um, this guy's a complete idiot and he's gonna get himself killed. Which is what all the cops around him are saying. Um, but the reason he always gets out of it and is still alive and still has a job is because he's so, like, sharp and good at what he does. It's like when, um, when he's talking to Ronnie Cox later and he says, um, he says, you have, you're one of the best detectives he's got. And I just find that very hard to believe. <laughs> um, but seeing him throughout the movie, we know why that is, because he's so good. <laughs> um, and that also kind of comes in the way he's written, too. It's, it's worth noting, um... This is very interesting and probably something that would not happen today. Um, this movie got an Oscar nomination for original screenplay. Nice. <laughs> yeah, 84 was a very interesting year for original screenplay. Um, and this made it in there. Um, which is great because it's a really, really good um, script. That really, really The pacing is really, really good. The structure of it. Everything just unravels perfectly. The characters, we know exactly why they do what they do. Even if that seems what they're doing seems extremely questionable. We just kind of have enough of a sense of the character that we know why they do what they do. Like, the, um... One scene that comes to mind is when... You you think about what would happen in real life, or in another movie. And you have the scene when um, Axel goes into the restaurant, and he's gonna confront Victor. But he does the thing where, in order to get inside, he goes up to the guy and he puts on the the kind of flamboyant gay voice and he's talking about how um the tests came in and they're positive and victor needs to know and i think it would be best if i told him myself <laughs> <laughs> he makes the guy uncomfortable enough to where the guy says why don't you just go in and tell him this um and yeah you'd think that would never fly in real life and in any other movie he'd probably be killed instantly but because it's Axel and because we've seen how he manages to get himself out of stuff, we totally buy that this works for him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and I also love how, they once again, that balance is always there. Um, we go right into the, yes, I think that was the best moment, into him walking into the restaurant. And once he walks into the restaurant, we're in a serious crime movie again. But it feels seamless. It doesn't feel like we were just in one movie, now we're in another. It always feels like we're in the same place, despite the fact that they jump back and forth between hilarious comedy and some heavy drama and a very kind of somewhat elaborate crime story. Um, well, not too elaborate, but it's there's multiple things going on. Um, even up to the point to where um, his friend Mikey, I think is his name, uh, the guy that sets the whole movie off, the guy that played... Um, the other spec brother to James Remar in Django. The one mm -hmm. that busted his leg, I believe, is the guy that plays him. Um, and we only get to know him for one scene. But this scene is really, really important because it's what sets the whole movie off. Because the whole... Everything Axel is doing is to find out uh, who killed his best friend and why. And he uses the term best friend, but we're like, well, they didn't... They seemed in totally different places in Beverly Hills and uh, Detroit. Detroit. And... So, but that one scene, um, we pretty much establish everything we need to know, and we get throughout the whole movie why Axel would want to avenge him, especially in the moment when 
we learned that they used to kind of, um, despite the fact that Axel's a cop now, they used to commit crimes together. And there was that moment where they stole a car, and Axel never got arrested for it because Mikey never ratted him out for it. And so that was kind of something that always stuck with him. And, like I said, just it, there's only one scene, but when Mikey's killed in the very next scene, and Axel says, I'm going to do everything I can to find out who did this and why and avenge it um, in one way or another, you just buy it. It only took one scene, but you totally buy it. Um, so that's a, that's a huge credit to, uh, the acting and writing involved here. Um, and then we introduce, obviously, our, uh, other two characters with, um, Billy and Taggart, who are Judge Reinhold and, uh, John Ashton, I think is the guy's name. I believe so. Um, he was also in Gone Baby Gone. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's very interesting is there's two very different, these are two very different characters introduced into this movie that have two very different reactions to Axel and two very different kinds of relationships with him. Um, obviously, Bill, you can just kind of tell because he's played by Judge Reinhold, but Billy's the one that's kind of more laid back about it and he's kind of a bit more gullible and easy to get in. He wants, he really wants the shrimp sandwich that's sent to him by he's Axel. He's fun in the entire series. Yeah. Um, I, re I always love the moment when... Um, they're at the, once again, we're combining action with our comedy. There's this shootout going on when all when the crime story comes to a peak, and Billy really, really wants to be the good cop. So in the middle, he's so misguided though, because he's just so kind of ambitious about it, uh, but naive at the same time. Uh, during this shootout, he decides he's going to be the good cop. So he stands up and says, "Police, you're under arrest!" While he's being shot at. <clears throat> He means well. Yeah. Um, and then I love that moment between him and Taggart where, um, this will sound familiar, when the shootout's happening and they're the only two there. And Billy says, this is like the ending of Butch and Sundance when they're in the Bolivian place and the army's out there. <laughs> and he's excited about it, but Taggart's just kind of saying, you need to stop. Because we know, it's never said, but we know Taggart's thinking, did you see the end of that movie? <laughs> that is not who we want to be. <laughs> no, not at all. But Billy's so happy that he feels like Butch and Sundays. He's just so excited. <clears throat> um, and I, obviously he's the more, uh, he's the more timid one too. I love the moment in the strip club when they're just kind of sitting there hanging out and then Axel just looks at him and says, Hey Billy, don't be embarrassed if your dick is hard. Taggart's dick's hard right now, but he won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Murphy was on top of the world in the 80s, without a doubt. He could do no wrong. No matter what people say about party all the time. Yeah, and then, um, just in general, um, while the Judge Reynolds scenes are really funny, um, it's really interesting to watch the progression of his relationship with Taggart, because Taggart's the one that's against him from the get-go. Right. Um, but as the movie progresses, it, there's kind of the... it's It takes a long time, too. That's what makes it so interesting to warm up to him. Um, but then there's finally that moment after they stop, um, at the strip club when they stop the shade down there, uh, Tiger kind of has, Tiger sees how smart he is and how good he is at being a detective, and there's the great moment when he makes up, uh, the super cop lie, <laughs> and then Tiger, you know, says, says, you know, Foley gets all the credit and it was us that screwed up and stuff like that, and, um... And, of course, Foley's in complete disbelief. He's like, I had the perfectly good lie going there with the super cops. You had to just fuck it up. <laughs> just go with the lie if you can. <laughs> um, so it's just it's just full of really rich characters, and the casting is so perfect. Like, I cannot imagine anybody else in these roles at all. No. We also have, because um, Victor is Stephen Murgoff, who was fresh off, uh, just the year before this, he was the Bond villain in Octopussy. A Bond villain in Octopussy. He was the general... Um, and his henchman is Jonathan Banks, who everybody now knows for Breaking Bad, but, uh, has been around for quite some time. Also, this year, he was in, uh, both he and Judge Reynolds were in Gremlins. So, <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have some more supporting casts. Some, some are supporting players, some are just flat-out cameos. Um, Surely everybody remembers Bronson Bento. Yes. And the the thing about it is every time I watch this movie, I am floored by Bronson Bento, and I'll tell you why. Um, he just comes in, he says a few really funny lines, uh, and then he's gone. He, he says, so, the way he pronounces his name, Serge. Serge. And then the um, his his back and forth with Axel, but get the fuck out of here. No, I cannot. <laughs> um, 
he's in this movie for like 30 seconds. But you could swear he's in like at least half of it. Yeah. Because he's so memorable. <laughs> he Like he's in the movie for one minute. But you just, ne I never realized that. Because he, it just seems like he was such a bigger part in this. But he only, he just has the one scene and then he's there in like one other scene practically in the background. And then that's it. He leaves a lasting impression on you and his character just He, he showed up in one or two of the sequels, didn't he? He's in three for sure. Because <laughs> he says, call me Serge. It's not Serge. It's not some sort of detergent. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And I, of um, course I gravitated towards that one because it was themed at uh, Great America. Yeah, a lot of people don't care for the scene. A lot of people hate three. I love three. I was, I'm okay. biased I mean, though. I mean, it really went off the tone. I think it was the issue. Yeah. Um, and the se the second movie with, by Tony Scott, um, gets pretty hardcore. Yeah. That was the one with, like, uh, Bridget Nielsen and Dean Stockwell, and it was, like, it kind of went into a darker place, but, um, I know, despite that one's reaction, I, I like that one, too. I've seen it quite a few times as well. I like the sequels. Um, but this one definitely is, like, you know, right on top, obviously. Um... So, uh, yeah, and once, and once again, though, there are those things, um, that just stick in your mind forever. Uh, there's the running joke about how shitty his car is. I, I love when he pulls into the fancy restaurant and he pulls up to the valet and he says, um, be, be very careful when the, all this shit happened last time I was here. <laughs> um, and one thing that I think will stand the test of time forever is Axel Foley's laugh. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> Everybody know like, as soon as I say those words, you hear it in your head immediately. Um, I especially love the, when he's uh, walking down the sidewalk and he sees the dudes in those jackets, and he actually stops and has to grab his stuff. <laughs> and that song, that theme song, it's like, yeah. that's iconic right there. <laughs> um, and it's been referenced in, I don't know how many movies. Oh, yeah. Um, and remixed just everything. Everybody knows that song. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird when you hear that. That's known as the theme, and that's the one that everybody remembers. I almost keep forgetting. It, it almost kind of feels like we're supposed to see the theme as the heat is on. Yeah. But um, that is really uh, what people think of when they think of music in Beverly Hills Cop, or just music and movies in general. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Especially in the 80s. Yeah. Oh, um, we got so caught up in Bronson Mitchell, I forgot. Um, one of the people in his office is Paul Reiser, yes. who has a couple of scenes. Um, and the guy that gives him uh, the banana and the taillight <laughs> is Damon Wayans. Yes, it is. Because <laughs> he, he goes through the whole thing, and then he just kind of gives them away and does the shh thing. And then we never see him again. <laughs> He's there for like maybe ten seconds. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, I think a lot of people don't recognize him because he got hair. But, yeah, but it's definitely Damon Wayans. I believe he's in sequels as well. It was um, I don't think so. No, because it was um. I thought he was bald in three. No, because it was um, it because Chris Rock kind of took on that, and I think that was the second one. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, his his part was bigger, but yeah. it was still kind of that you know comedian that we remember, and then they just have a really small part, and then they're gone, and they weren't really. Quite as big as they got, they were they eventually got when the movie was out. Like I'm gonna get you, sucker! When Chris Rock did the how much for one rib, and that ended up going to in living color. And yeah, yeah, which had Damon Wayans in it Exa as a henchman. Oh yes. Um. So yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything I missed here. The interesting thing also here is, um, the fact that this turned out so well because at the time this came out. If this movie came out now, it'd be dangerous. Oh, yeah. Because what was going on was Murphy had SNL, mm -hmm. and people were just like, oh, my God, he's brilliant. And then 48 Hours came out, and Trading Places came out, and he was just it's insanely huge. Oh, yeah. So when they made Beverly Hills Cop, all they could have said was, if we just put Eddie Murphy in this, we've got a hit. It doesn't matter what else we do. But everything else in this movie is just, it, he, everything in this movie is on par with everything else in it, which is really great. Like I said, the side characters, the writing, just, like I said, even people like, um, like Surge, you, you could put a supporting player in there for 30 seconds and they make a memorable impact. Um, and like I said, the relationships between the characters, everything. The, um, uh, the girl that's in it, whose name I, she's like the only one that kind of falls short, because I never remember that there's really a female role in it. Until I'm watching it, I was like, oh yeah, that character. 
I mean, she's she very much progresses the plot because she's the one that kind of is always pointing Axel in the directions to go. Right. But um, I always I always just kind of forget her characters here. <laughs> Weren't they going to reboot this a while they back? Were gonna they, do, like, it's not developmental hell right now. Well, they were going to do um, a fourth one is still on Brett Ratner's IMDb page. Ugh. And then there was the, uh, they were going to make a TV show that didn't take off. I remember that, yeah. That they actually shot where Brandon T. Jackson was his son. And he was actually in it as Axel. Um, but I don't think anybody's ever seen that. I think it just kind of, like it has an IMDb page from a couple of years ago. I remember hearing um, about it and was interested I, in I, how I, it I think, I think they just shot a pilot and then nothing came of it. So it's like Andy Dick doing uh, the Get Smart yeah, remake. <laughs> it actually lasted though. Uh, but that's probably for the best though. Um, so, so, I mean, it was kind of promising that he was in there as Axel, but, um, I'm going to assume he was probably just totally wasted. So, um, so now we've talked about the brilliance that is barely has got for 21 minutes. Um, let's go over to 48 hours, um, which is probably going to make me wish I had started with Beverly Hills Cop. Just hold on, though. I'm not going to bash 48 hours. Come on. Just, <laughs> mm -hmm. um. Certainly not for 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. So, um, obviously, um, this was Eddie Murphy's movie debut. Yes. And it was, it's a very interesting place to put, uh, you see, oh my god, that guy's funny as hell, um, let's put him here, uh, to start with, because you'd think it'd be some comedy vehicle to start with, and while 48 Hours is a comedy, um, the thing about 48 Hours is you could basically split it up to where there is the movie before Murphy, and then there's this movie after Murphy comes into it. Um, and once again, like with Beverly Hills Cop, it could have been totally just, you feel like you're in two totally different movies and it's off-putting, but um, it just feels seamless the way they do this, because the first 25 minutes or so of 48 hours is a crime drama. Like, there's practically no comedy in the first 25 minutes. It is all crime drama. Um... Where we have Nolte and um, Jonathan Banks is one of the cops this time instead of one of the henchmen. He's switching sides as well. Um, this versus makes more they, sense as we they, they, they both switch sides of the law on each movie. <laughs> um, and we have our antagonist who is James Reamer. And James Reamer is the kind of partner of Reggie who is Eddie Murphy's character. So the idea is to bring uh, Reggie out of prison to help us find... James Reamer. Um, we're on the, while we're on the subject of James Reamer real quick, it's worth noting that this movie is by Walter Hill. Walter Hill also made a wonderful classic called The Warriors, I'm sure you've all seen. And that movie starred James Reamer, as well as David Patrick Kelly. And David Patrick Kelly played a guy named Luther in The Warriors. The, the, the bottles that come out to play mm -hmm. him. Uh, plays a guy named Luther in this as well. Um, and you look it up, they're not related. It's just a coincidence. But still, it is kind of fun to wonder. I mean, obviously there's a lot of continuity issues, but it's still fun to wonder, after the events of the Warriors, is this what happened to them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Luther is, uh, his bitch now, I guess? <laughs> That's interesting. Makes sense, but it's interesting. <laughs> um, so, and I'm pretty sure they killed Luther on the beach in the Warriors, but we're not really quite sure. Um, <laughs> so... And once again, this brought on a formula that probably existed before and we would see long after. And it is the uh, the cop partnered with the guy he doesn't want to be partnered with, who he's going to hate at the start, but ultimately might respect, while he's getting screamed at by the captain. And once again, it's worth noting another connection, which is probably a reference in this movie. Um, we always talk about how one of the go-to over-the-top police captains, one of the ultimate um, parodies of police captains is Frank McRae in Last Action Hero. Exactly. And the police captain in this movie, who is basically that character, is played by Frank McRae. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, I'm going to guess Last Action Hero just went all out with that reference. I'm sure it was. Like, <laughs> um, that movie will end up on here somewhere, down the line. Mark my words. <laughs> we talk about it too much. Um, so, yes. And then, of course, once Murphy is in this movie... Um, Talking about um, his introduction when um, Nolte is coming into the prison and we hear somebody singing Roxanne in a very feminine voice and it gets louder and louder the closer we get to the cell and then finally it's Eddie Murphy <laughs> with headphones 
singing at the top of his lungs. And which is probably one of the most famous comedic introductions of all time. Right. Um, they kind of, I feel like they kind of somewhat were going for that when they introduced him in Tower Heist. Somewhat. Because he wasn't, uh, obviously he wasn't, I don't believe he was singing in that, but mm -hmm. it was kind of the same kind of, we're taking you out of prison to do this thing. And basically, his entire character in Tower Heist is a reference to Reggie Hammond, <laughs> basically. Doesn't surprise me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, okay. The it's very interesting to look at um, the way this movie treats its subject matter because um, we were at, we were in 1982, uh, which was a different time. Yeah. Um, and naturally, in this era, this was natural. Um, since Nolte is teamed up with Reggie, of course he's gonna be a little racist. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. Um, and we have lines like, um, Reggie's trying to, you know, cut deals with him and try to, you know, benefit from this, uh, get trim and get pussy, as he calls it, uh, while also get food and stuff like that. And Nolte's response to him is, I don't want to hear your jive. <laughs> I don't want to hear your jive. <laughs> and, um... And I was trying to wonder, because I'm not quite sure how things were in 1982, because it was still eight more years before I was born, but um, trying to figure out if uh, the movie in that regard is a little dated, or if Nolte's character was intentionally written in a way to where he's kind of... Out of touch? Something like that. That that makes sense, honestly. Um, but, the, I mean, there's the, I don't want to hear your jive thing, but then there's the other scene where... He could call Reggie a number of things. He could call him shithead. He can call him motherfucker. He could call him anything. What does he call Reggie? Watermelon. <laughs> oh my god. But that's the thing, though, is I laugh, uh, despite uh, the racist stuff. I'm thinking it's so... He's so over-the-top racist, it's kind of supposed to be funny. Right. Because who fucking says that? Exactly. Who calls somebody Watermelon. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and yeah, we have, um, Annette Tool in here as well, um, who I normally like, but here she's just kind of the, why are you never home, why, L like, every scene she spends is practically on the phone, like, that's it, um, but still, there's, okay, um, obviously not as many memorable side characters as Beverly Hills Cop, is my point, um, I, James Reamer is a good actor, and he's got a very... In, he's got an intriguing character in this. Um, like, the vil the villain in this movie is is quite evil. Like, more than you'd expect in a movie like this. Um, but uh, the trouble is that there's just not a whole lot of... There's nothing really stand out about them. Like, yeah, yeah a villain is evil, and in a movie like that, that really, in this, that really stands out. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like... Um, what was that movie? Um, oh, um, it was, it was Let's Be Cops, when they had, uh, James Darcy as the villain, and he was so cruel, he seemed really out of place in that comedy, that over-the-top comedy. Right. Um, that's kind of, it doesn't quite reach that level here, but it reaches that level in the sense of, yeah, you can make your villain pretty, you know, evil and cruel and badass and stuff like that, um, but there's no lasting power. Um, and that's, for me, this is kind of what that whole movie, what this whole movie is. Like, when I'm watching it, I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, but there's just not a whole lot, like, I really don't remember much of it until I'm watching it. And then I kind of remember everything. It's not good. Um, but, there, I mean, of course there are memorable scenes. One in particular, of course, the scene where, um, Eddie Murphy basically reenacts the French Connection. Um, when he goes into the Redneck Bar full of racists, and he owns them all, uh, <laughs> posing as a co-op. Um, and this was basically the scene where it's like, there's always kind of that thing where Eddie Murphy had already had it made on SNL, and then there was this, and this movie, you know, got a very positive reaction, and his performance got a very positive reaction, and he was going to take off regardless. Um, but it's a star-making scene in itself. Every, whenever you think about where Eddie Murphy came from, um, it always comes back to this scene where you're just like, 
that's when everybody knew this dude was going to be the dude. Um, and yeah, it is a really good scene. There's also some, um, Walter Hill, um, has, has an interesting lineup. You, you've probably seen his name on a lot of movies, particularly, like, 80s action movies. Um, like, most recently he did Bullet to the Head, where I thought he really, he really captured his old, kind of, his old-fashioned action kind of style there. Um, and he did movies like Johnny Handsome with, uh, Mickey Rourke. Does anybody remember that one? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really not bad. And he did, he did Hard Times with Charles Bronson, and I think, I think James Coburn was in that one, too. Uh, that was an interesting one, too. And he did Streets of Fire, uh, which is really good, if you can drag it down. Um, with, like, Diane Lane and Rick Moranis and Willem Dafoe, and it had, like, motorcycle gangs and, like, you know, sexy singers and shit. It was, it was very, very 80s and very, very awesome. <laughs> um, but he also did movies like Red Heat with Schwarzenegger and Belushi, which is just fucking dreadful. Um, so where he's kind of like the epitome of 80s action, and he's also the low point of 80s action. And he doesn't really, but he doesn't really have kind of, there's not, he doesn't really have a particular style uh, that stands out. Yet somehow, whenever you're watching a Walter Hill movie, you know you are. Uh, like, like I've said before, he did The Warriors. That's the first thing that always comes to mind. Um... So that's that's a very interesting uh, way he does it, and yeah, he's mainly known for his action movies. And there are scenes in this, particularly um, the shootout where James Reamer's on the bus and they're in their car. That's a really cool scene. Um, as brief as it is, it's a really good scene uh, and a really good action scene um, where it's it's like a simultaneous shootout and car chase. And for for 1982, they pulled it off really well. It's it's a really cool scene. Um, but the only issue is, I've just, this movie's just never really left much of an impression on me. I still can't help but wonder, some, there are many scenes that kind of feel like they have a bit of a, it is very influential in its genre. Like I was saying about Lethal Weapon, this was, um, five years or so before Lethal Weapon. Um, and all, while all these movies were influential in this buddy cop thing, I don't even know if you can call it buddy cop here, because, uh, Reggie's a convict, but still... Um, <laughs> it's, you can definitely see where it was, a lot of things are taken from this movie. Um, and that's great, but at the same time, it still feels like there's a bit of a dated quality to it, um, that the likes of, say, Beverly Hills Cop doesn't have. Um, and it's just, it's, it really just, I, to me, I know a lot of people love this movie, and it's certainly a classic by definition. Mm. Um, but to me, it doesn't hold up near as much as other movies of this type, like Lethal Weapon or stuff like that. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. I don't dislike it by any means. Um, it's just never really one that sticks with me. Like, I, like I said, I had to rewatch it, uh, to do this video, because my memory of it is just so vague whenever I haven't just seen it. It's actually, this case is actually empty right now because it's still on my DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I watched it this morning before I left because uh, I needed it absolutely fresh to talk about it. Um, and that's kind of a... Uh, while um, I do think it's decent, for sure, um, that's kind of telling. Yeah. That I just, it just kind of leaves my mind so quickly, despite the classic that it is. Um, so obviously... Um, Berlioz Cop is all about where I am. So, <laughs> um, but still, you know, I mean, I respect 48 Hours, sure. You know, I don't, I like, when people bring it up and say, like, oh, I love that movie, I don't, you know, question why. It's just like, I'm sure you do, and that's great. <laughs> um, it's just never really been one that's really stuck with me the way it has other people, but at least it's not bad or anything. That would be, <laughs> that, right. that would be trouble, but uh, no, it's not at all. So... So that's going to end another edition of Verses. Uh, next week, uh, to be announced for the last Verses of January, and then February, we're going to have some fun. So that should be entertaining. Entertaining so much that I created that word from last year that I said accidentally, and now we're going to make it a thing. Entertaining is now a word. We don't have to make anything a thing if we don't want to. Anyway, uh, yesterday we put up the Guilds video, and that's uh, currently able to be watched. Plus, we also have Friday's uh, reviews of Dirty Grandpa. And the fifth wave. The boy will come next week. 
with uh, Fifty Shades of Black as well as um, Kung Fu Panda 3 and The Finest Hours. So that's what we've got for this week. Uh, later tonight, if you're a wrestling fan, tune in at 11.30 p.m. for the Royal Rumble podcast. Monday, Game of Thash returns. And uh, Tuesday, of course, will be that 11.30 p.m. on Monday night, which will be the replay of the Raw podcast. Wednesday, of course, we'll bring NXT and Total Divas and the rest of the Wednesday Wrestling Podcast and Thursday, Seven Snack, Friday, AJ's Movie Reviews, and Saturday, the Screen Actors Guild Awards. Yes. And next Sunday, Brandy Versus. So that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? I think that's it. <laughs>